Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to Pulse Exchange. Uh, I'm sorry that we have such very large class sizes here. Thank you all, my job, very able people. Uh, welcome to this uh, event on school reform. Uh, education reform is one of the most interesting areas of public policy, and it's certainly one of the areas where this government has been the most radical. Uh, schools have always been a very, very big priority for us here at Policy Exchange, and one of the things we've always tried to do is to try and listen to the people who are actually improving schools on the front line. Uh, so before we hear from the Minister this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce someone who has 25 years of experience as a successful head teacher. Uh, so Michael Wilshaw is currently uh, Executive Principal of uh, Mossbourne Community Academy. Uh, he was previously head of uh, sort of Bonaventures Ventures out in Newham. And he's also the Director of Education for ARC Schools, which is a federation of I think soon to be about 12 schools all uh, doing phenomenally uh, well. Some people say his approach is quite uh, traditional, in other ways it's also very, very innovative. Uh, so it's a huge pleasure to be able to welcome him here to Policy Exchange this morning. Thank you so much. Good morning everyone and, and thanks to Policy Exchange for uh, inviting me. Uh, as I was having uh, uh, breakfast this morning with my wife, <coughs> so I had a important speech to make to me she said well as i was going through the door please do not be like victor meldrew as you usually are and she and she uh, she echoes what my long-suffering pa has had to put up with over the years um, when she's heard admitting being admitted from my office i don't believe it when some weighty tone from the department or the local authority has landed uh, on my desk, but I'm not. But I'm not going to be like Victor Melty this morning. In fact, quite the reverse. I'm going to say some very optimistic things about what's happening in the state education system. And I'm not saying those optimistic things because I'm in the company of the present Secretary uh, of, of State. Um, optimism, because I think we're doing great things for the education service at the moment, and particularly for those children that I've worked with for, uh, for many, many, many years, the poor, in, poor and disadvantaged children in the inner city. And I say that from 43 years of uh, experience in the inner city, in places like Bermondsey and Peckham and West Ham and, and Hackney. And in those 40 odd years, um, I've succumbed to bouts of terrible depression and despair that nothing much was being done, and we weren't going to break the link between um, poverty and uh, achievement for those children. That the combination of woolly educational theories, low expectations, poor leadership, professional associations who occasionally defend the indefensible, and above all, local bureaucracies which sucked in the money and sent out all sorts of um, uh, dicta dictats to, to schools, but actually didn't uh, um, uh, uh, impact upon school performance. But I'm optimistic now for the following reasons. <coughs> the first reason is the academy program, and that there is a clear understanding in the academy program that it's about freedom and autonomy for schools, for teachers, and for head teachers, investing in the people who make the difference. People in the classrooms, people in the corridors, people in the playgrounds, people who accompany the children to the bus stop at the end of the day. They make the difference. People who work in the town hall, in the bureaucracy, do not make the difference. But we've managed to use those freedoms at Mossbourne by doing the following. We've got a new contract for staff, which allows them to work much longer than is the norm. So I've got youngsters working to 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the, in the evening having their evening meal at Mossbourne and not uh, going home to sometimes really chaotic home lives where they're not going to receive the support they, they need, to need to receive. And I've got staff who need to be incentivized through bonuses and through a salary structure which allows us to be competitive and to pay those people to stay there to do those sorts of things. It's allowed me to adapt the curriculum to meet the needs of the disadvantaged child with more literacy and more numeracy. I could have done any of those things if I remained within a local bureaucracy. And the results speak for themselves. And excuse me if I 
polish my halo and burnish my breastplate on this one. In, an air, in, in a school which receives children below the national average, over the last two years, we've achieved over 80% 5 a star C grades, including English and Maths. Um, we've got um, all our youngsters in year 13 uh, going off to university, 60% of the Russell group, with 10 acceptances at Oxbridge. Our English, a third of our youngsters get the English baccalaureate, and we expect something like 70% in the next years to achieve that. So the below average intake with 40% of preschool meals, with 30% on the special needs register, with the highest number of statements to children of any secondary school in the borough of Hackney, we're doing that, and we managed to do that because of the freedoms that have been given to us. That's the first reason I'm optimistic. The second reason, and it's the focus I know of today's talk by, by the Secretary of State, is the creation of greater diversity to respond to parental concern. Academies have been part of that, but responding to what parents want is a key issue. And that's why I'm in favour of the free school idea. And I, again, I go back to my school. Because we've been successful, we, re we received something like 1,500, 1,600 applications for 180 places each year. About 800 to 900 of those applications are first and second choice preferences. Now, something like 700 of those people are going to be disappointed. And their disappointment shows the number of appeals uh, that take place, and the appeals against the appeals, the constant barrage of letters that I receive every day from those disappointed parents, being buttonholed as soon as I go out of the school by, by parents and saying, please, 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 can you find a way of getting my son or daughter into, into Mossbourne Academy? And I'd love to be able to say to them, you know, you've got your second or third choice school. And they say, well, that's not good enough. I want my son and daughter to come here. So that is why we've approached uh, Happy Learning Trust with the idea of setting up a free school south of the borough. And there's an argument going on at the moment about that because there's a political dimension to this. And they might, they might want a, an academy. And they're in favor of academies. And there are five academies in Hackney, but not necessarily free schools. And political ideology shouldn't stand in the way of something that parents want. And this is about responding to what parents want at the end of the, of the day. So I'm hoping that Hackney might change its mind within the next few, yeah, the next few days. And although, and this is the final thing I'm going to say about free schools, and although there will be opposition now, I'm sure there will be a huge amount of opposition, there was the same opposition to academies eight years ago when I started Mosbourne. It wouldn't work. This idea is useless, it wouldn't work, we'll look at it now. So I urge the Secretary of State to carry on with the principal idea, because although there will be political opposition and local opposition in local areas, we've um, it, 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 seen the academy programme that needs to be overcome. And the third reason I'm optimistic is that the quality of leadership is improving in our schools. I've talked about autonomy and freedom and independence, we're creating more Head teachers and principals of schools that are enjoying that freedom, who are entrepreneurial, who are businesslike, who think outside the box, and who are real, uh, real problem solvers. People who can handle that autonomy. Mm. Now, the, the big, the, the, I've always said this in terms of leadership, the biggest difference between the outstanding and good head and the mediocre head is that ability to challenge, to challenge underperformers, to take on people and say, this isn't good enough to monitor the quality of provision in, in the school, especially teaching, and say to somebody, that isn't good enough. That distinguishes the mediocre head from the good head. And that's tough. Have we got three and a half thousand head teachers and principals of schools that can do that, can challenge? No, we haven't. Have we got 1,500? Probably not. But we've got a growing number of people who do know how to challenge. And they're going to be the leaders of the future in terms of federations, and clusters of schools who can support those schools to become better. And the future of the education service and an increasingly independent and free education service they are these small but growing phalanx of outstanding heads who can challenge, who can role model success to less experienced people. And the fourth reason, and this is the final thing I'm going to say, I'm optimistic and not 
of the victim melodry of my wife's view is this, is that we've got a growing number of very good teachers coming into our schools now. The, the quality of the teaching force that's coming into teaching is far, far better than it's ever been in my 40 years experience. And they will want to become leaders in our schools and head teachers in our schools as long as they don't leave in that first four years. And that's why behaviour in schools, culture in schools, the quality of leadership in the schools to retain those people are very, very important. So I'm urging the Secretary of State to be as radical as he has been up to now, as revolutionary as he has been up to now, and to support the progress that's been made in the last few years. disadvantaged kids. Um, I, as you were speaking, I, I was very struck by, by the point that you made about how these, these freedoms are kind of self-reinforcing and how the more people who enjoy them and, and turn schools around, the more people there are who want to do more. Uh, and you can see that in the, this room today. I, there's a lot of people here who are involved, I know, in setting up schools, almost a kind of generation change. I'm always struck by politicians how often talk about wanting to change the culture, but it's a very hard thing to do, and that seems to be starting to happen in education. And I was struck, uh, looking at the papers this morning, uh, there's some very intriguing numbers about the numbers of uh, free school applications for the second round. And so hopefully we may be hearing a little bit about that from the Minister. But it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have our, our former Chairman, in fact, at Policy Exchange, back in, the, back in the room, now in the guise of the Education Minister. So Michael, it's a pleasure to have you back here. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, thank you, colleagues. And thank you in particular, Sir Michael. Um, Sir Michael uh, promised that he wasn't going to be Victor Meldrew, that he wasn't going to give us reasons to be pessimistic. Um, and it was true. Uh, he wasn't Victor Meldrew, he was Ian Jury. Uh, he gave us reasons to be cheerful, parts one, two, and three. Um, but as I thrilled to hearing what Sir Michael was saying, um, a terrible thought struck me. Um, Sir Michael is actually the person you really came to hear, and I'm just his supporting uh, band. But then I remembered what Ian Dewey's supporting band were called. Those of you who are as old as me will remember that they were known as the Blockheads, which is perhaps um, the role in which I find myself today. And certainly, I am tempted to think back, as Neil alluded to, to the time when I was the, uh, the chairman of Policy Exchange, when this think tank was founded. Anyone who doubts that the quality of the leadership of an institution matters should just look at Policy Exchange. When I was the founding chairman, it was a tiny and impoverished think tank on the fringes of political influence, more often mocked and overlooked than heeded. I stepped down as uh, chairman in 2004. In the last seven years, under the inspirational chairmanship of Charles Moore and the leadership of Anthony Brown and Neil O'Brien, it's become Britain's leading think tank, an ideas uh, powerhouse, and a force for good across the sphere of public service reform. So that only goes to prove that when you get rid of an underperforming head, <laughs> you can liberate the talent that has always lain latent. Um, now, I know that as a nation, we are blessed with some of the best schools in the world. And Sir Michael leads one of them, which is why I'd like him and others to lead more. But the reason that we need to unleash the talent that's there is that at the same time, we all know that there are far too many schools in England that are still strong. There are hundreds of primaries, where the majority of children fail to reach an acceptable level in English and maths. There are primaries where the majority of children leave ill-equipped to face the challenges ahead. On a human level, it's a tragedy. For many of those children, because of the failure at primary, their time at secondary is marked by, at best, frustration and disappointment, and at worst, defiance and disruption. On an economic level, this failure is a serious threat to our international competitiveness and it puts our economic recovery at risk. Because as a country, only about half our pupils manage at least a C in both English and maths GCSE. Whereas in economic competitors like Singapore, it's four and five. And in the last decade, despite the hard work of many inspirational people, we've still plummeted down the international league tables. We've moved from being fourth in the world for science to 16th from 7th to 25th for literacy, and from 8th to 28th in mathematics. The mathematical skills of British 15-year-olds 
and now more than two whole academic years behind the skills of 15-year-olds in China. And while other countries have raced ahead over the last decade, we have overall, in the words of Andrea Schleicher, the OECD's Director of Education, stagnated. And this stagnation leaves children poorly prepared for the world we face. We all know that we've just suffered the worst financial crisis since 1929. Our economy is weighed down by a huge debt burden. Europe, as we know today, has major problems with debt and the future of the single currency. Meanwhile, there is a rapid, a historic shift of political and economic power to Asia. And there are also a series of scientific and technological changes that are transforming our culture, economy, and global politics. Unless we have a school system that is adapting to and preparing for these challenges, then we will betray a generation. Already, almost half of UK employers are unable to find the scientific and mathematical specialists they need. And the majority of firms predict problems in finding such staff in the future. And what makes the situation so much worse is that domestically, this unpreparedness, the poor performance I've talked about, is so powerfully concentrated in areas of disadvantage. Far too often, deprivation is destiny. We have one of the most stratified and segregated school systems in the developed world. More than 70% of poor peoples in parts of China and Hong Kong exceed the standard expected of them, compared to just a quarter here. And the gap in attainment between rich and poor, which has widened in recent years, is a scandal. Schools should be engines of social mobility, places where the democratization of knowledge helps vanquish the accidents of birth. But in the system that we inherited, the gap just widens over time. By the age of 16, a deprived people is only half as likely to achieve five or more good GCSEs, including English and maths, as pupils from more privileged backgrounds. And by 18, the gap is vast. In the last year for which we have figures, out of the 80,000 poorest, pupil, poorest pupils in our school system, those eligible for free school meals, just 40 made it to Oxbridge, down from 45 the previous year. Far, far too many young people are being robbed of the chance to shape their own destiny. It's a moral failure, a tragic waste of talent, and an affront to social justice. That is the reason why we need radical, whole-scale school reform. And when it comes to deciding what such reform should be, we need to start by looking to the best. And the best, and those who want to be the best, are changing fast. When you look at the highest performing and the fastest performing education systems, there are three essential characteristics that stand out. The best performing nations, like Finland, South Korea, and Singapore, all recruit their teachers from the top pool of graduates. Which is why we're reforming teacher training and expanding programs, such as Teach First, Teaching Leaders, and Future Leaders, who attract the brightest graduates into the classroom. And because the biggest barrier to talented people coming into or staying in teaching is still poor behavior by pupils, we are also strengthening teachers' powers to maintain order in our new education bill. Secondly, the top education nations are uncompromising in their commitment to rigorous accountability. The latest analysis, again from the OECD, underlines that proper testing helps lever up standards. You do need mechanisms that send a relentless signal that you believe that we're holding everyone to higher and higher standards. And that's why we introduced our English baccalaureate, to encourage more children, especially from poorer backgrounds, to take the types of qualifications that open doors to the best universities and the most exciting careers. And the third factor I wanted to identify today is that high-performing education systems are those where government knows when to lead and when to step back. We want a school system in which teachers have more power and in which they are more accountable to parents, not politicians. It's this characteristic of success, this driver of reform, which Sir Michael referred to, that I want to focus on today. Rigorous research from the OECD and others has shown that more autonomy for individual schools helps raise standards. In its most recent international survey of education, the OECD found that, quotes, in countries where schools have greater autonomy over what is taught and how students are assessed, students tend to perform better. In Singapore, often cited as an exemplar of centralism, the government has deliberately encouraged greater diversity in the school system, and dramatic leaps in attainment have been secured as a result. Schools where principals are exercising a progressively greater degree of operational autonomy are soaring ahead. And as the scope for innovation has grown, so Singapore's competitive advantage over other nations has grown too. In Sweden, 
the old bureaucratic monopoly that saw all state schools run by local government was ended. Over a fifth of Swedish schools are now non-selective, highly autonomous state free schools. Academic studies confirm that pupils at these schools get better results than pupils at traditional schools. Free schools also improve standards across the local authority, and the level of parental satisfaction has therefore significantly increased. In Canada, and specifically in Alberta, a diverse range of autonomous schools offer professionals freedom and parents choice. As a result, Alberta now has the best performing state schools of any English-speaking jurisdiction. And in America, where the charter school system implemented by New York and Chicago is perhaps the quintessential model of school autonomy, the results are extraordinary. The medium income of families in New York City charter schools is 30% lower than in the city as a whole. Ethnic minorities, who have historically been failed by the school system, are overrepresented in charter schools. Charter school neighborhoods are 75% more black and 30% more Hispanic than across the city as a whole. Yet at the same time, these charters are helping the pupils to achieve amazing things. And it's certainly not down to cream skimming the intake. Pupils attending charter schools achieve better results than those who applied for a charter school place but failed to secure a place in the admissions lottery. And the longer pupils stay in charter schools, the better they do. A pupil who attends a charter school is 7% more likely to get a high school diploma for every year that they're there. So three years in a charter means a pupil is 21% more likely to get a diploma than if they'd attended a traditional state school. In his excellent article in this month's Atlantic magazine, which I encourage you all to read, New York City Education Chancellor Joel Klein holds up Harlem Success Academy 1 as an example of just what autonomous schools can achieve. Harlem Success Academy 1 has a people intake of among the most disadvantaged in the state, yet the school now performs at the same level as New York City's gifted and talented schools all of which have tough admissions requirements. While New York, uh, sorry, while Harlem Success Academy 1 randomly selects its pupils by lottery. So when schools achieve those kinds of results, parents sit up and take notice. As Klein says, we should make sure that every student has at least one alternative, and preferably several, to their neighborhood primary school. In New York, we implemented this strategy by opening more than 100 charter schools in high poverty communities. Tellingly, Almost 40,000 families chose these new schools, and another 40,000 are on the waiting list. Across the world, as we can see, autonomy is proving a key driver of success. The good news in England is that we already have some excellent domestic examples to draw. Granting greater autonomy has already generated success here. In the five or so years after 1988, the last Conservative government created 15 city technology colleges. These schools are all ability comprehensives, but they enjoyed, and enjoy to this day, much greater independence than other schools. Overwhelmingly, they're located in poorer areas, yet this doesn't stop them achieving great results. Seeing the success of CTCs, the last government took the principle of autonomy forward under its academies program. The scheme took chronically failing schools away from local authorities and placed them under the wing of a sponsor who was given freedom and flexibility to implement real change. Last month, academics at the London School of Economics published a landmark assessment of the scheme. They found three things. First, academy conversion generates a significant improvement in pupil performance. Second, this improvement is not the result of academies creaming off pupils from nearby schools. The fact that more middle-class parents want to send their children to the local academy is a consequence of the school's success, not a cause of it. And thirdly, and most significantly, beyond raising standards for their own pupils, academies also tend to raise pupil performance in neighboring schools. Success, it seems is contagious. Now, it would be negligent not to try and build on this success. So we're expanding on what's already working well. We remain committed to the original strand of the Academy's program. Indeed, we're taking it further than ever before. This year, we will open more sponsored academies than the last government did in the first eight years of the Academy's program, and more than in any single year in the history of the scheme. 88 schools have already been identified and will open as new academies in the next academic year. And we are also expanding the programme to help failing primaries. We're working to identify the weakest 200 primary schools in the country, and they will become academies starting in September 2012. But autonomy isn't just a mechanism for reversing underperformance. It works for accelerating high performance as well. So we decided to allow those professionals who were already doing a brilliant job to really spread their wings. 
We began by allowing any outstanding school to convert to an academy. And now we're enabling more schools to reap the benefits of autonomy by letting any school apply for academy status provided it's teamed with a high-performing school. The rapid conversion of so many great schools to academies means that there is now a pool of excellent institutions to build chains of schools, simultaneously autonomous and collaborative, working in partnership to raise standards. Over 1,200 schools have applied for academy status. Over 800 of these applications have been approved. Over 400 have already converted and are open, bringing the total number of open academies, as I speak, to over 700. Tony Blair, the architect of the reform program that his party has now so sadly rejected, said that reaching 400 academies would have a transformative effect on the education system. Well, we've almost doubled that in one year. We are transforming education in this country at an unprecedented pace. And if it's possible to become an autonomous school by partnering with another school, or by securing a sponsor, or by converting, then it should also be possible to start a truly autonomous, truly free school from scratch. So we invited teacher groups, parent groups, charities, and others to apply to set up their own schools. In the first year, over 300 answered the call. And I'm delighted that over a dozen free schools are expected to open this September. Before the election, countless people told me that it was foolish to expect any free schools at all to open in September 2011. Pilot the scheme for September 2012, they said, and didn't expect any serious numbers until September 2015. We proved them wrong. The first free schools will open just seven to 12 months after submitting their initial plans to the department. <coughs> in historic terms, this is remarkable. In the past, it normally took between three and five years to set up a maintained school. Ellen Green School, one of the first parent promoted schools, took four years to open. JCOS, a Jewish community secondary, led by, among others, the uh, famously <coughs> assertive property developer, Gerald Ronson, took nine years. It took five years to create the, fifth, the first 15 CTCs. It took one term of office to create the first 17 academies. <coughs> Yet we expect to have more than a dozen new schools open in just over a year. And we're not just getting great new schools open more quickly. We're doing it more efficiently, too. We're not being prescriptive about free schools, and so they will come in all shapes and sizes. Some are housed in existing schools. Others will be based on a range of refurbished and adapted buildings, including a former library in West London and an office building in Central <coughs> Norwich. The critical point is that we've been thinking creatively about how to secure excellent new schools at a time when budgets are tight. Delivering high quality education against the backdrop of public spending pressures is one of the two major challenges facing my department. The other is demography. Nationally, we could need around a quarter of a million more primary school places by 2014-15, with London feeling the squeeze more than most. So we announced in December that we would double the level of what's called basic need funding spent by the last government. It's going to be £800 million, and that is specifically to help local authorities fund new places for children arriving at primary school. And the Free Schools programme could help us alleviate some of the pressure as well. Schools like the Harris Free School in Peckham and Redbridge Primary will, from September, help meet local demand in areas facing a serious problem with places. But satisfying local demand is about more than the macro-level argument of basic need. On a human level, it's about meeting parents' desire for a good local school. A school that's easy to get to, that feels like part of the community. Unsurprisingly, a number of applications come either from community groups trying to save a beloved local school, or to start one in a hitherto neglected area. Like Star, Valley, sorry, you know, like Star Valley Community School in Suffolk, or the Savers Group in Bretland, where Parents Save Our School campaigns are protecting the ideal of great community education. And even where there are places at local schools, they're not always the type of school that places that parents are happy with. A choice, as I might want to do, between two things you don't want is not really a choice at all. Free schools, therefore, offer a genuine alternative and they have the freedom to be different. Like the Norwich Free School, which will integrate high quality education and childcare year round. The school will be situated right in the heart of Norwich, so that working parents can make full use of the affordable, extended school provision, which will be available on school premises for six days each week, 51 weeks of the year. And what is also remarkable is just how many free schools want to use this freedom to innovate specifically for the benefit of the very poorest. In America, the charter school movement was started by idealistic young teachers 
who were tired of the entrenched practices that were persistently failing the most vulnerable. There was the same appetite for change here, and it's clearly manifest in the first tranche of free schools. The teachers, under the inspirational head teacher Patricia Sauter, running the outstanding Cuckoo Hall Academy, for example, have decided to set up a new school, Woodpecker Hall Primary Academy, so that they can reach more deprived children in North London. Indeed, a third of the free schools aiming to open in September are located in the 20% most deprived areas in the country. And we hope to see many more free schools targeting disadvantage in the future. As Neil mentioned, the latest application round for people who wish to open free schools in future years closed just two weeks ago. And as the free schools team in the department goes through the proposals, we're already seeing some interesting things. Encouragingly, there's been no drop off in momentum. Despite introducing a much more rigorous application process, we still received 281 applications to set up a free school in 2020. For the first time, we called for groups to set up special free schools so that children with special educational needs could have access to more excellent state special schools. 20 groups have answered the call. For the first time, we invited applications for alternative provision free schools so that we could provide more targeted intervention for young people at risk of exclusion. 34 groups took up that challenge. And we're also encouraging businesses and universities to help tackle the shortage of high quality technical education by setting up university technical colleges. 37 groups have applied to open a UTC next year. 12 applications have come from existing academy providers who, like Cuckoo Hall, want to use their expertise to help even more of the poorest pupils. And over half of the applications, 126 in total, came from teacher, parent, or community groups ready to play a bigger role in shaping local children's futures. We've even had an application from a premiership football club. Everton FC is hoping to start an alternative provision free school that would use sport to engage a wider spectrum of students. The process, as you can see, is continually evolving. We're constantly reviewing and refining the programme to help get high quality schools open where they're most needed. We've always made it clear that we want children from the very poorest homes to have access to the very best education. If there are academy sponsors or free school groups who especially want to target poorer children, then we need to think of more ways in which we can help them to do just that. We're currently consulting about whether academies and free schools should be able to prioritise children receiving a pupil premium in their admissions. Schools would know that the more children they manage to attract from poorer backgrounds, the more funding they would get. The pupil premium gives schools the money they need to help the poorest. And changing the admissions code could let that money operate as a genuine incentive. And while we're in a hurry to get new schools open up and down the country, we're still uncompromising when it comes to quality. The bar for entry has now been set high, and we make no apologies for that. In recent months, we've adapted the application process, making it more rigorous and learning from the best practice around the world. We've developed a new application form requiring applicants to provide more details about their school. We've introduced interviews for shortlisted proposals so that we can ensure only the strongest are successful. And we've introduced a single application deadline, allowing us to judge applications against one another and identify only the very best to take forward. And also, we've been vigilant to ensure that this process is not abused by those whose principal aim is not improving opportunity for the poorest adult children. As the Prime Minister made clear in his Munich speech, we are absolutely determined to ensure that no one who has an extremist agenda, whether it's politically or religiously extremist, has access to public money. Of course, this is a free country, and we're never going to attempt to police what people believe, but we are determined to ensure that those who receive public funding, and especially those who are shaping young minds, do not peddle an extremist agenda. That is why, in response to an excellent policy exchange report, we have set up a dedicated team within the department who will rigorously police any application for public money, including free school applications. And we make it explicit in the application guidance that we will reject any proposals who advocate violence, intolerance, or hatred, or whose ideology runs counter to our shared democratic values. So the application process is rigorous, but clearing that hurdle doesn't mean that schools are off the hook. We know that autonomy works best when it's paired with sharp, smart accountability. That was why last week I announced that we would intervene in the weakest 200 primary schools and put them in the hands of sponsors who could turn them around. 
It's also why I said that we would identify a further 500 primaries for urgent collaboration with the department. I said we'd raise the four standards and ask more of all our schools. And let me be clear, these tough measures apply to maintain schools, academies, and free schools alike. When it comes to failing schools, there are no favored children, no get out of jail free cards. When an academy is failing, when a free school lets people down, then action will be swift. But just as we must be uncompromising in our vigilance, we must be unyielding in our resolve. There'll be glitches and hurdles along the way. Reform is always an untidy business. Sweeping reform, even more so. There are no smooth revolutions. But still, we must press forward. We are, after all, spurred by a moral imperative. We simply cannot afford to let another generation of children down. Thank you. You can um, put your hand up, and if you say who you are and where you're from, I'll let you take questions. Thank you. Do we have any starters here? So, uh, there's, a, there's a dilemma which uh, Sir Michael identified by his 34 percent. I think Michael, uh, I think you've got Marcy being back, and. Uh, that doesn't sound terribly impressive until you realize that in the country where only 22% of the population take the English class, take the requisite exams to get the English class. And the national average is 15 so. Exactly, and the national average is 15 So uh, that is impressive. But um, and what that indicates is, is Michael, Sir Michael, as opposed to Colin Michael, and Sir Michael's uh, lack of attachment to that weasel phrase of Gordon Brown's curriculum, which has in it everything. Michael's uh, um, curriculum does not have in it everything. It has fundamental disciplines which will be important for our children to be grounded in. So, how do you balance autonomy with the need to avoid uh, schools which have 36 PCSE subjects, uh, which I know? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for the work that CFBT has been doing to help um, improve the state education system, and indeed, the work that you're doing through the Free Schools Programme, through the Academies Programme, and elsewhere, we're in your tent. Um, the second thing is, um, the balance between autonomy and accountability is one that every government will strive to get right. Um, and um, in seeking to find the Aristotelian golden mean, um, we may sometimes err. But I think we're getting closer to it. I think it's up to schools to decide which courses they should offer their students. And students in choosing those courses, and schools in offering will have to bear in mind not just the ambitions and aspirations and enthusiasms of children, but also the consequence of those choices for children thereafter. We know, because universities at last are acknowledging the case, that uh, it's not the case that all qualifications are equal. Some are more equal than others. The Russell Group, for example, have revealed that if you'd like to go to one of their universities, there are certain A-levels which are regarded as um, what you might call the 4 by 4 A-levels. They can go anywhere, they're all weather A-levels. If you take them, you can get into any course. And they are, perhaps unsurprisingly for this audience, English, maths, the sciences, by which I mean physics, biology, and chemistry, history, geography, and a modern or classical foreign language. If amongst your clutch of A-levels, you have those, then almost any course is open to you. There are other A-levels which are intellectually engaged, which are fun to pursue, which for people with a particular passion will provide them with absolutely the outlet that they need. But these are the A-levels that maximize your opportunities in years to come. And it would be derelict of us not to draw attention to that. And that's one of the things that the English Baccalaureate does. It allows people to be on a pathway for a greater degree of choice, both when it comes to A-level and then when it comes to jobs, apprenticeships, or indeed university courses. Now, of course there will be some students who at an earlier stage say, actually, I know it's not for me, and the school will know that even as they are restricting their options in some cases, they're pursuing enthusiasms that will take them further. But ultimately, it's my responsibility to ensure that our accountability mechanisms allow parents and students to see which courses will take them further. There are more changes that we will make 
both to the way in which schools are held to account and also to our national curriculum, but help ensure that students, particularly those from poorer backgrounds, are not neglected or overlooked when it comes to school performance. We want to make sure in particular the poorer students, those with a low level of attainment from the primary school from which they come, and those who are with special educational needs are the focus of particular attention. But overall, I believe, and I think it's implicit in your question, and certainly explicit in Sir Michael's work, that we have got to raise expectations for all students. As I've said in the past, one of the problems that we've had in this country is the belief that uh, an academic education should only ever be available to a minority. We don't take that view in Singapore for a very good reason. Yes? Hello, Sally, not to mention the Foundation. I'm quite fascinated about um, talking about parents. Um, if you thought, for example, that the parents who want to get involved in free schools are very active, I've always thought that we don't have a client base for schools. So when we've taken over, I don't like to use the word, but failing schools of schools that were getting 19%, not one parent has come up, knocked on the door and said, that's not good enough for my child. And that's quite astounding. And then to change the school to an academy when you have an open evening, um, say six people turn up. And that is a common story until the school changes, until they see what's happening. <coughs> I think it must be because they feel disenfranchised, they feel frightened, they maybe didn't enjoy school, and they don't understand that they have the right to come and challenge a school. So I think that's really exciting what you're saying about schools all needing challenged, and they need challenged by absolutely everybody. So I think it'd be interesting if, if the kind of parents that are devoted to the free school movement could help the parents that mm. perhaps don't have um, the, or the desire to be involved that much, but they do need to know how to integrate with their schools. Yeah. I mean, I feel a bit like that. This big society can be a bit overwhelming. I don't want to run my library, but I would like to say, and I'd like things delivered differently. So I think sometimes we have two extremes. We have the people that are heavily involved, then the ones that just don't understand how to get involved on a small level. I think there's an, a series of incredibly good points. I mean, the first thing, Sally, is I'd say that um, if you were running my local library, I imagine it would probably be better on than it is at the moment. Putting that to one side, um, there is a broader point here. Our parents concerned. I mean, one of the things that folk often say to me is, um, parents aren't interested, and they cite some of the, 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 the real life cases that you do about lack of parental involvement when that opportunity exists. But if you take it back to the starting point, is it the case that parents are aspirational for their children? Manifestly. The Millennium uh, Cohort Study. Um, I think I'm right in saying, asked parents recently, uh, mums, whether or not they wanted their uh, baby son or daughter to go to university. Something like 95% of mums said they would. So it wasn't the case that they thought university is too grand for the likes of us. They were desperate for their child to succeed right at that moment of maximum hope. We also know, as Sir Michael mentioned, that um, in Hackney, once Moss Bourne opens, then parents beat a path to his door. And the same is true with many of the other outstanding schools that we can mention. If they know that by filling in a form or by um, expressing a preference they can get what they need in their busy lives, they will. Parents know what a good school looks like. I've often used in the past the uh, case, and I hope people will forgive me if they've heard it before me using it again, of Jade Goody. Jade was uh, held up to ridicule as someone who was an exemplar of uneducated Britain. But when she had the money, and she made enough money to prove she was a lot smarter than almost all her detractors, she sent her children to an independent fee-paying school, the traditional uniform, strict values, teaching English baccalaureate subjects, and all the rest of it, because that was the way to get on. Parents know. The problem is that the system has insufficiently engaged them. One of the great things about academy sponsors is that they bring often an entrepreneurial uh, approach which says, we're going to engage you, we're going to leaflet, we're going to contact, we're going to attempt to bring you in to the life of the school. And one of the great things, for example, about free school, about people like Peter Hyman um, and the team who are setting up a free school in New, is they've already been leafleting and contacting parents in New. And hitherto, parents in New Irmore, County Durham, have assumed that they simply have to take what they're given. They can express a preference, it'll be ignored. They can talk to their counsellor, the counsellor will say, talk to the hand. There's nothing that they can do, so they become passive and um, cynical and resigned. But if they meet someone, determined to transform their child's life who's going to open a new school, then that change can come. And I don't know if someone wants to say anything more about that. Yeah. 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 Ye
Well, I think it is very much a chicken and egg argument, this one. That I remember when I was seconded to a, uh, to a, a failing school in uh, Canning Town in, in East, East London. Um, parents didn't engage with the school because it was failing. Uh, they didn't come to the open evenings because uh, the school was failing and didn't engage with the parents. As soon as that school started to improve, as soon as the results got better, as soon as the behavior improved, as soon as, as soon as the word got out that this was a fast improving school, attendance at the open evenings improved and engagement with parents improved. And I think uh, and that, and that sort of example has been replicated elsewhere in the country. It's really a chicken egg. School needs to improve, and once parents see that, they become more engaged. Any other questions? Sir, uh, yes, there. Greg Hurst from The Times. Is it a good thing or a bad thing if a uh, free school tries to poach children from beyond its catchment area and from primary schools that feed the feeder schools for other secondary schools? Does that introduce healthy competition or does that undermine collaboration between schools which is important to their success? It's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> My assumption, I'm a teacher who has set up a free school in Greenwich, uh, the Greenwich Free School, uh, along the, the model of the KIPP schools in, in the United States. Um, I was very pleased to hear you call attention to those of us who are setting up schools in inner city areas this morning in your speech. Um, and I was wondering what more the department intends to do over the coming years to encourage more groups to set up schools tackling disadvantage in the most needy areas. Because clearly, a lot of the criticism of the programme is focusing on schools being set up in what the media calls middle class enclaves. And actually that flies in the face of what we and a lot of our colleagues here this morning are, are doing. What more can you guys do to encourage that in the future? Okay, it's a, great, it's a very important challenge. And I think one of the things is that, um, well, I, we'll see I think when the program develops that um, many of those who have been characterized as quote, middle class people setting up schools for themselves are certainly people who um, are, I suspect that many of them can't do anything about it irredeemably middle class. But that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the case that they are setting up schools simply in order to favour uh, them and theirs. If you take, for example, someone like Peter Hyman, who uh, is a former pupil of University College School in Hampstead, um, Peter is, is middle class. He did the most middle class thing imaginable, which is working for Tony Blair in a number 10 down. <laughs> the pinnacle of bourgeois aspiration. Um, however, he's now repenting for that by, um, by setting up a new school in New um, and I think if we look at the history of education throughout the ages, it's often the case that people who will have been caricatured as do-gooders are actually those who are most determined to ensure that um, uh, aspiration is more widespread. But you're right. We can't just rely on the saintliness of Peter and others. We've got to positively incentivize the system in order to encourage the process that um, uh, you, I think, heroically are engaging in. And that means both making sure that we align the admission system and incentives like the pupil premium. It means that the education endowment fund that we're setting up with a starting uh, capital of more than 100 million pounds is there to help the innovative practice that free schools generate um, work. It also means that we need to put pressure on those local authorities that serve the very poorest and ask them why they're not engaging more um, energetically. Um, one of the things that uh, I've found is that there are some local authorities that do serve uh, poorer areas, which have been supportive. So, for example, Haringey have helped in the establishment of a new free school with a geo ethos but an inclusive uh, admissions policy, um, and that's been wholly welcome. But there are other local authorities who uh, represent areas of educational underachievement and disadvantage that have been hostile to the creation of free schools for narrowly ideological reasons. And I think that um, uh, I certainly won't go out of my way to name them at the moment because there's still time for them to repent and to work with us. But uh, their voters need to know, come the time of the next local election, if these are people who are standing in the way of good provision for poorer students. But ultimately, it's a uh, process where um, you can never say that you've moved far enough. Given the scale of the problem that we've inherited, um, one of the things that I always have to think about is how we can do more to help precisely the students that our school is intended to help. Yes? <coughs> Paul Wall from politicshome.com. Uh, Michael, your children, along with those of the Prime Minister, uh, attend St Mary Abbott's in Kensington, which is an excellent primary state primary. 
Um, but for those of parents who are worried in your area about the risk of going to a free school because they're untested, what would you say to them? Would you actively consider a free school, maybe Toby Young's for your own children? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I would. Well, um, the state must be wary of picking winners, but yes, I absolutely would um, think of sending children to a free school. As it happens, I'm listening to a colleague of mine, Ed Vasey, is sending his uh, son to the Ark Conway Free School. Um, so he is a pioneer. Um, I think that there are superb free schools. I'm fortunate actually in that one of the secondary schools closest to where I um, live is an academy, um, Burlington Danes. I'm also fortunate in that my council, Kensington and Chelsea, has a superb school in Holland Park just down the road and another great one, Chelsea Academy, that's opened. But also Rod Aldrich, um, who as well as being a great businessman, is a philanthropist, is planning to set up a new academy just down the road from where I live in North Kensington. So there's an embarrassment of riches, so Toby will have to raise his game. Uh, in order to <laughs> Yes. Um, can we... Uh, Chris took from the Financial Times. Um, the uh, Telegraph has this figure that there's going to be 100 opening next year. Can we get a statement on that on the record? And secondly, um, the central problem for the department is the fact that you have a very small capital budget, only 3.4 billion pounds by the end of the parliament. Can we confirm that all the free schools can be paid for out of capital grant? whether any going to be PFI or some sort of low-fi PFI to the capital voucher to the revenue project? Two very questions. Um, on, the, on the first question, which is uh, numbers, um, the, the New Schools Network um, uh, is the organisation that's done more than any other to help ensure that um, we've had high-quality applications from a wide range of individuals. There are 200, and groups, I should say. There are, um, as I mentioned earlier, over uh, 200 applications. I haven't had a chance to study them in depth. The department's had a a basic sort of triage process, and as you can see, I've shared some of those figures almost as quickly as I got them with as many people as possible. So we'll look through all those applications, and we will authorise as many good schools as we can. Um, I think it's the case that New Schools Network believe that there are a hundred schools that have the capacity to be um, truly outstanding. I'm reassured by that every time that the New Schools Network has shared information with me um, about the process. They've proved to be uh, cautious enthusiasts, but obviously, I can't preempt the process that we've set in place because the law and due process means that we have to look properly at all of them. But there's the broader issue of capital. As I mentioned, um, the uh, problems that we've inherited from the last government are not just a matter of uh, a huge debt overhang and therefore pressure on cash for all of us, but also insufficient care and attention ever been taken to additional pupil numbers. One of the things that I did early on when I took over was authorise a review of how we spend our capital. <coughs> now, I believe that the last government had paid insufficient attention to the quality of teaching. It believed that if you had marquee buildings, things would automatically improve by themselves. Now, I want our focus to be on innovative teaching practice. But you do need to have fit and proper buildings, and you do need to have space for every child who's coming on the school roll. That's why Sebastian James conducted the review that he has in order to make sure that we get more bang for our buck. We're going to uh, let Parliament know first how we're going to respond to that, and it's my intention to let Parliament know before we rise for the summer recess, God willing, on how precisely we'll make sure that the capital budget goes further. One thing that I would stress is that the amount of money that we have overall for schools capital over the course of the spending review period is more in each year than the last government spent in its first eight years. So again, there are pressures and challenges, but it is also the case that they need to be put in the context of, I have to say, the uh, understanding and vision that's been shown by Danny Alexander and George Osborne in the light of this particular issue. The, um, the James doesn't talk about funding, uh, it talks about procurement. It's not an issue about PFI, capital money, anything else. So it's not relevant to the James Review issue. So you could talk about revenue and capital and whether you're intending to use any of your revenue budget to build buildings. I could do, um, but one of the things, as you appreciate, um, and as the Financial Times appreciates, is that these issues are interconnected. How you procure relates to how much you want to spend. And it's probably wise for me to ensure that when we talk about every capital issue, we do so in an holistic way and report to Parliament on it. I can quite understand why readers of the Financial Times would want to know which precise mechanisms we might use. But because they're interested, 
um, I have to be wary because inevitably any information that might secure a commercial advantage to those who read the FD rather than let's say City AM is information that I probably better <laughs> hold back for a moment. Yes. Um, Rebecca Kramer, Teach First Ambassador and proposer of Reach Academy, Felton. Um, something you talk about a lot is revolution, and um, something that defines a successful revolution is coherence of vision and the space for collaboration amongst the people that are part of that revolution. Do you see that as being important, and is that the role of the new schools network, or will there be something like the SSAT that will exist for free schools? So, um I think the New Schools Network exists to fulfill a number of functions. I think it's there to provide advice and support um, uh, for those who wish to set up, but I do think that there is a need to ensure that there are groups, if not a group, that speaks up for those who are involved in establishing free schools and puts pressure on us. I mean, I think one of the things that um, uh, government benefits from is having people who are holding it to account, who agree with perhaps the broad thrust of its agenda, but wanted to go further or wanted to, to move in a particular direction. And following on from the earlier point about making sure that we do everything possible to help schools set up in areas of disadvantage. If it's the case that our reforms to the admissions code aren't working, that are not driving forward the change that we want, and that there are other things that we should do, then having a group that can speak for those who are involved in the front line would be enormously helpful to us. I don't mind if there's anything more you want to say about that. Yes. Hi. My name is Shashin Comrie, and I'm a parent of part of a parent group that's applied to open a um, comprehensive secondary school in uh, Wapping and Shadwell in East London in 2012. Um, Shadwell has the highest level of child poverty in the whole of Britain, but we're right next door to the city of London, and so all our property prices are at a premium as well. Um, what is the government doing to enable groups such as ours, and, and often it is the case that, that groups in areas of high deprivation do uh, are surrounded by areas of high uh, property prices. Um, what are you doing to help us gain access to the premises that we will need? Um, I'm doing everything I can, but I still think it's not enough. Um, we're going to be changing the planning rules in order to make it easier uh, to secure consent for um, buildings that are going to become schools, and we'll be saying more about that, specifically my fantastic colleague Eric will be saying more about that in, um, shortly. We're also making sure that we um, provide information about all of the buildings that are currently um, held by public authorities, which could be used for schools. I talked about um, a library earlier, which happens to be in uh, Hamsworth and Fulham Council. But there are local authorities that have buildings that are not being used. Um, the government's own estate has buildings that are not being used. And we need to make sure that they're made available to people like yourself who are running a social enterprise. And it's critically important in an area like Shadow. Can I say something about, about, can I say something about um, uh, those parents who haven't got the sharp elbows um, and the organi necessarily the organisation of schools to start up preschools, although they, they would welcome uh, preschools? The people who are beating a path to my door come from a range of different backgrounds, but predominantly from the estate next door to my, to my academy. And it seems absolutely vital that their concerns are championed and that they're given the organisational skills that other people uh, uh, might have in greater uh, abundance. So we need to have our ears very close to the ground on this one, and if there is greater concern from people, people who haven't got those organisational skills, still want a free school, still want a different provision, we need to get close to them and champion them. I think it's a good time I can tell I've just been texted for two more questions, if they if people want. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Tom Reynolds from Public Service Review. Um, how will academies and free schools achieve in terms of skills output, specifically in science and technology, uh, the, the skills need, which is um, there in the economy? Well, I think overall, the entire school system has to respond to that. And I think there are a number of uh, nudges that we're giving. Um, I mentioned the English Baccalaureate earlier. Um, I think some of the changes that we're going to make towards the national curriculum will help um, uh, establish a benchmark which schools, even though they can depart from it, will have to have regards to in order to make sure that they're competitive in the eyes of parents. But ultimately, I think all of us recognize that mathematics and science are the subjects which guarantee our children the best possible opportunity to grow and flourish in the, uh, uh, the course of the next few decades. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm hoping to say a little bit more about how we're going to reform 
support for mathematics and science across the entire state school system. But it's already the case that there are some free schools that are setting up that have deliberately chosen to stress mathematics and science at the heart of their curriculum. One of them, the King's Science Academy in Bradford, set up by a chap, Sajid Hussain, son of a bus driver from Bradford, who deliberately believes that for the children um, uh, uh, from a similar background to his own, whom he wishes to serve, that the level of scientific literacy needs to raise, um, I know the level of scientific literacy needs to raise, um, uh, be, be raised by itself. Um, and uh, I think that one of the ways in which he aims to do that is by making sure that, for example, every student is following physics, biology, and chemistry at GCSE, rather than the combined science GCSE, which was at one point seen as a way of widening access, but is now increasingly being superseded. Um, so they play their part, but I don't think we should look just to academies and to uh, free schools to help us change um, and improve attitudes towards science and mathematics. Any questions? If not, then I just want to say thank you very much for coming along. If any of you have detailed questions about the proposals that have come forward so far, because the department has to preside over a process which needs uh, a certain integrity of all its own, can I recommend contacting Rachel Wolf at the New Schools Network? And Rachel, I know, will be delighted to share with you the details of some of those who are applying. Rachel can be an impassioned advocate on their behalf. I now have to be a stern judge about which of those uh, proposals we're going to support. Um, Thank, Thank you all very much. Michael, it's been a pleasure having you here this morning. It's an exciting program. It's uh, clearly moving very fast. And it's been great having all of you here this morning. So many people, it seems, in the room setting up their own free schools. It's a very inspiring thing to see. So uh, to our uh, little headlow of Michael, so Sir Michael, I'm uh, just Michael. Uh, it's been great having you here. And thank you for, for opening you.